right, well, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to have you back with us, and it's great to have you with us, Mr. Mike Walton. Uh, thank you, Axel. Um, always great to see the My Recovery team again. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, so today, everyone, we've got a, a bit of a special treat. We're moving up in the world, uh, and we've had a few requests over, over these uh, these past few months of doing joint school for, from people who said, basically saying, what about shoulder replacements? And so, uh, an extra special session today uh, on shoulder replacements, and perhaps in particular also talking about day case shoulder replacements. Well, so Axel, yeah, my name is Mike Walton. Um, I'm a shoulder surgeon and also clinical director of uh, Upper Limb Surgery at Wrightington. Um, for my sins, my practice seems to have evolved over the last decade from mostly sports injuries to mostly joint replacements. Um, we're very fortunate at Wrightington, we do do a high volume. Um, we're to 350 to 400 cases a year now uh, with quite a high proportion of revision surgery. And over that period of time, my practice has, has evolved quite considerably um, through, without any specific rhyme nor reason, it's been an evolution um, largely dictated by factors outside of my control. Um, the biggest most recently has been the COVID pandemic, um, which has caused us to really think about what we do, how we do it, why we do it, and how to do it all in the safe manner as possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Well, so, well, so perhaps should we, should we take that as a cue to, to dig into how we've moved from you know, the best part of a, of a week of an inpatient recovery to two day case uh, or same day or sometimes called outpatient shoulder replacement where you come in and go home the same day. What has enabled that? Well, yeah. So um, if uh, we first started looking at it, um, well, I've been a consultant now for 10 years. And so we started looking at it probably eight years ago when a, a, a fellow came along and said, why do my patients go home um, after one or two days when most of the shoulder placements he'd seen in the past went home at three to four to five? And the simple answer was, is I operated on Thursday. So I saw them <laughs> on a Friday and they went home. Um, there was no more rhyme nor reason than that. And um, we hadn't really thought about it, but all the, the nursing staff on the ward liked to get rid of them before the weekend. Um, and so... At that point in time, uh, the biggest thing that was keeping patients in was their antibiotics. And so I used a very standard um, three doses of kefiroxine um, joint replacement standard protocol, um, uh, two doses post-surgery, post one at eight hours and one at 16 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the, when I would see them on a Friday morning, all of the patients would be waiting for their last dose of antibiotics before they could go home. And they went home around about lunchtime. Um, and, and then I, I moved operating days from Thursday to Friday. <laughs> right. Um, and, and we started looking at what we could do. And, and the first thing that changed was, the other thing that kept my patients in was their post-optive x-ray. Okay. And on a Saturday morning, most of them were missing their x-rays for various different reasons, uh, failure in communication. Right, yeah. A um, bit of time, busyness of the radiographers on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And so we had got into a discussion with the radiographers about how we could streamline this process. And we went through a number of different iterations. But ultimately, both the radiographers and, and me felt that it would be easier to do their x-rays in recovery. And so we would do a plain x-ray in recovery on a Friday evening. And I would see it before I went home. And so that was another box ticked of the things that had to happen the following day. Um, and so, so now they were now just waiting for um, a full blood count and they were waiting for their third dose of antibiotics. Um, and so the next thing that happened was our microbiologists didn't really like kefiroxium anymore and they didn't like it for hip fractures. Okay. And so they, they changed our hip, um, our hip fracture um, antibiotic prophylaxis for a number of reasons to ticoplanin. And tycoplanin was a single shot um, at the time of induction. And some of our hip surgery colleagues were moving towards using this as an antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, there was a lot of research coming out as the leading cause of problems in um, shoulder replacement surgery was from chiacnes um, and looking at the, um, the coverage and different types of antibiotics that were most appropriate. Um, and so on the basis of and all those different factors, I moved to using tycoplanin as a prophylactic antibiotic. Okay, and suddenly my antibiotics the next day now have gone away. Um, and, and so then 
for various reasons, I moved back to operating on a Thursday again. And now I would see my patients on a Friday and they didn't need an x-ray because they'd already had it. And they didn't need any antibiotics because they'd already had them. Um, they, they did have a full blood count, but we audited that and realized we'd not acted on it for a decade um, because a, 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 a standard shoulder placement very, very seldom needs any form of blood transfusions post-optively. Um, and I would meet them all on Friday morning and tell them they could go home. And so about two or three years ago, we decided to take a slight plunge. And um, in my fit and healthy men who lived locally, we said, look, you know, if you would like to go home, you can do. We'll keep your bed and see what happens. And so we did probably three or four cases and no one ever came back. Um, we then audited what happened when they stayed in. And, and the only real thing that happened was when the block wears off, there's a, a degree of breakthrough pain. Mm -hmm. And the comments from the patients that we let go home on the same day of surgery was that in, in a couple of them, that breakthrough pain was difficult. It didn't last very long, but it was manageable. So we then sat down with our um, anaesthetists and we worked out a different pain pack protocol. And this tied in very nicely with some of our other day case surgery, notably large rotator cuff repairs, also having this difficult breakthrough pain um, in the middle of the night. And so we, we looked at the options that we had available to us and we developed a third pain pack which would give our patients Oromorph. And we gave them a very defined small quantity that would last a maximum of three days. Mm -hmm. And we added that into our pain pack uh, to cover people through breakthrough pain. Yeah, okay. and, and, and as an ad hoc system, that enabled us to let patients go home on the same day. Um, but COVID really changed everything um, because when we started coming back to operating, um, it was me and many of my colleagues viewpoint that the risk of catching COVID was going to be intimately linked to the length of inpatient stay. And what we did was instead of just listing my shoulder replacements for, as an inpatient that could go home as an outpatient, mm -hmm. we started listing them as outpatients. Now that may seem like a very small change, but it changes the mindset of the entire process. Yeah that suddenly the pre-op team are looking at the social system that would facilitate going home early. Rather than determining that on the day of surgery, if the patient was okay, we started looking at it ahead of time. Um, it changed um, a lot of the mindset of the anaesthetists to be looking for reasons that would enable somebody to, um, or that would require someone to stay in as opposed to reasons why they could go home. Um, it, changed where we sent the patients um, and the mindset of the people on the ward and all these different things started to change outside of my sphere of influence within the patient pathway and journey and it also changed the patient's um, viewpoint on it um, and when we did that suddenly we found that by saying going by staying in overnight was the exception as opposed to the norm everybody got on board very very quickly and of all the replacements we've done over the last three months, only one stayed in overnight. Wow. Okay. Um, and everyone's found the, the process very straightforward. Um, I've had no, we've had no issues with pain overnight. Um, all the patients, because again, we're, we're labeling those day case, they're all seen by their physio before they go home. They're treated much more in the same way that we treated our cuff repairs and arthroscopic surgery. Um, and, it's facilitated doing the operations in different hospitals, in different environments, in different ways. And, and patient satisfaction has been great. And um, I think it's actually, a, particularly in the current environment, a very, very safe and reproducible way of doing this traditionally, inverted commas, major surgery, which turned out to actually be, in some ways, easier to manage overnight than, than some of our arthroscopic cases. Yeah, yeah phenomenal. That's, that's, that's really interesting to hear about these these very small changes that can add up to these quite, what is quite now quite quite a big change, quite a big effect. Yeah, and those were not thought of. I think if we look at the reasons why we kept people in for those lengths of times, all of them were dogma. And, you know, they stayed for three days because my boss stayed in for three days, and his yeah. boss stayed in for three days. And, yeah. um, that's just the way we do things. And, and actually, if you look at the rationale for, for almost everything we do, 
most of it is based upon anecdotal based dogma as opposed to any form of evidence nor nor thought process yeah and, but, and so, so various things have changed uh, sort of in the organization and and, and and in how the operation is done you mentioned a few things that the patient would experience but what what, what has changed from from the patient's point of view or in terms of the patient experience with a What's different with having it on the same day as opposed to how things were done previously? Um, very little, really. Um, I think th there's a slight mindset change that um, if you're having uh, an operation as a day case, there are things to kind of set up at home. Mm -hmm. And so we do want to know that someone is around and able to look after you for the 24 hours um, immediately after the operation. Mm -hmm. We want to know that we've got all the social set up in place. We want to know that um, there's, you know, you've got a bed that's accessible. You've got um, someone to help you manage a sling. We've got the appropriate analgesia in place um, that you have access to a, a, a 24 hour telephone that you can call if there's any problems. Um, and when we started doing this originally and it was all very ad hoc, what we did was check all those things when you were when I saw you post optively mm -hmm. and we would ask, you know, do you have someone at home? Are, are these things in place? And if the patient said yes, then we said, okay, well, yeah, you can go home. Whereas by changing your philosophy and the pathway, you, you get to think about them beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so that, that does change the way that all the people in the process. So um, when you're reading my little, so we have a patient uh, so, shoulder surgery book, Mm -hmm. which gives top tips on all different bits of advice and you know, we utilize the my recovery app to help people through it and if you clicked the inpatient part of the book then that's one way of looking at things whereas if you click to the my operation is going to be a day case part of the book mm -hmm. then you prepare different things at home and yeah. um and whilst those changes are small they just facilitate being able to do it more straightforwardly yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and without perhaps giving giving everything away, and and and, uh, and of course we we here we have to speak a bit more generally than 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 for than for, for your own for, for your own patients. What 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 are some of those top tips um, for the patients? For, for the patient's point of view, yeah. For, let, let, let's say for, for someone watching this who may or may not be getting ready for shoulder replacement as a day case. So more generally, if we're zooming out, general top tips for getting ready for. A shoulder, a shoulder replacement, be it as a day case or be it uh, planned in the more conventional sense, which may be, you know, which, which will still be, still be quite a normal thing for, 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 for so, having a shoulder replacement. Um, the first thing to try and do is get some information on your sling. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You're going to come out for whatever shoulder operation you're going to have, you're going to wake up and this, this sling is going to be on. Yeah. And most of the slings that we use are, quite complicated. They've got lots of different straps in different places. Some of them have a big bolster to hold your arm away from your body. Um, and, and most of them look like a big spider's web of black and Velcro. Um, you may be lucky and have a very simple sling, but those tend to be a little bit less comfortable and a little bit less um, adaptable to different patients, size, shapes, um, and, and comfort. And so we use quite a complicated sling. And one of the most important things is in our, our shoulder surgery booklet is a, a big diagram of how this thing puts together and how to take it off and importantly how to put it back on again when it's off. And so the first thing to do is try, try and familiarize yourself a little bit or find some information about what your sling is. Mm -hmm. um, the, the next thing is to try and find a, a comfortable place where you can go to bed. Um, it's often in the first day is much easier to sleep sitting upwards a bit. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, a lot of pillows to help you sleep. Um, and that is the one advantage of being in a hospital whereby we have hospital beds which can, can elevate the back. Um, and so finding a nice comfortable place to sleep, making sure you have access to good analgesia um, and that's all in place and that should all come through the hospital um, and that, that analgesia is regular. And even when you've had a block which kind of gives you this sensation of a numb arm, it's really, really important to take your analgesia, even though it doesn't hurt, because that's going to help smooth out the transition between the local anesthetic of the block um, and better pain relief afterwards. 
Um, the next thing is clothing. You want to have stuff which is really easy to take on and off, bearing in mind you're going to have a sling and not be able to move your arm. And so not clothing which is not tight, nice and loose. Um, sometimes get a few sizes too big so you can put it over the top of your sling to begin with. Um, definitely um, have buttons to, to start off with rather than trying to squeeze your arm into um, various different tights. Although fashionable clothing. <laughs> um, and, and I suppose the last thing then is just have some support around. So prepare some nice, easy meals, things that aren't going to take too much effort afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, th I, th I think that's a really nice, uh, n n n nice set of steps to take before surgery. That, that will indeed be applicable to whether you're having it planned as a, as, as a day case or in the more conventional sense. Um, and, and you mentioned the sling there quite a lot. And, 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 and I know as well from through my recovery episode that this, the, the sling is a big cause of, of, of questions and concerns. And, so, and as you say, there's, 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 different, there's many different types and it can be confusing when you start looking at YouTube videos about and you see you know, how to use a different type of sling and so on. But, so, but with, with, with the sling, what are your general recommendations? Like how, how, long, how long should one keep the sling on for? In, in, in the sort of typical case with a, with a shoulder replacement? So um, we've got to differentiate slightly in terms of the operations that we do, that we have um, reconstructive operations mm -hmm. where we're repairing things um, and trying to get things to heal. Mm -hmm. So a rotator cuff repair or a shoulder instability operation where we have a period of time where we want things to, to, to heal. Um, and so that's, requires a degree of not necessarily immobilization but a degree of protection mm -hmm. um, we then have operations where the sling is for comfort mm -hmm. um, and it's it kind of imperative upon us as surgeons to to impart that information both to the patient and to the rehabilitation team as to what this sling is actually doing mm -hmm. and so um, in and then you need to have um, an understanding of what the quality and structural integrity of those repairs are. And so one would hope that in the vast majority of cases, we have created a construct which will be able to withstand um, normal physiological load. And so even in reparative reconstructive operations, one would hope that they're not tenuous enough to come apart by normal movement. Um, however, on occasion, we do do um, repairs or fracture management where we are concerned um, and we, we do want a period to, al to allow things to heal in a little bit better manner. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, and it's m so important, is that you go a very detailed operation note. That operation note is legible, preferably typed. Mm -hmm. That operation note is given multiple copies, so you have one for the patient, one for the rehab team, one for the notes, and so that all people at all stages can see what you've done and what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And so in the, on the basis of that, you, you can then determine what the sling is doing. And so that if you, if you do have a tenure repair, there may well be a period of time that, that we like you to stay in the sling for a duration to allow healing to occur. In most cases, though, it will be for comfort, but we will put in what we refer to as a safe zone. And that safe zone is where we are confident and comfortable that you can move within that um, range and not put any tension on the repair. Mm -hmm. um, from my own personal experience having shoulder surgery, coming out of the sling is a wonderful feeling. It feels that everything is relaxed and it feels more comfortable. And, and when I had shoulder surgery, I realized that if I felt like that, all of my patients would do too. And so they're all going to come out of their sling several times a day. And I've got two options. Either I let that process happen, mm -hmm. at which point they may do things that I don't want them to do, or I give them some, some teaching, I give them some guidance, and I allow them to do it in a safe and controlled manner. And so we very much opted for the latter, that we, we, we guide uh, sling use predominantly by comfort and the safe zone. And so we allow people to come out almost straight away um, but be guided by those broad principles. So the next thing is, is defining those safe zones and then teaching people how to use the sling and come out of it in a, in a, in a controlled manner um, and be very much guided by their level of discomfort. The last thing is that particularly in shoulder placement surgery, anatomic shoulder placement surgery, 
and in some instability operations, we use external rotation slings. Mm -hmm. So the traditional sling is across your chest yeah. and that's held in a position of internal rotation. And, and that can lead to quite a lot of stiffness, particularly in an extensive release such as a shoulder placement. And so um, I, I've started for some shoulder placements now using what we call an external rotation or neutral sling, which involves a pillow and it holds the sling in a position further out. Now, that enables people in the, in the very uncomfortable phases at the beginning, or when we're trying to repet, repair, uh, sorry, protect the subscapularis repair, mm -hmm. everything to heal in a much more neutral mm -hmm. position. And whilst it's a much less comfortable sling, it's slightly more awkward to use, and it's certainly more awkward to put on and off, um, once we take it off at around about two weeks, mm -hmm. then the patients are already then starting from a neutral position and then the recovery from then onwards is much faster. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I, we also use it for instability, but if we balanced people to the center rather than keeping them tight in either an anterior or posterior mm -hmm. direction. And so, and you mentioned there about, um, anatomical shoulder replacement. And, uh, I know that's a, a, another common question, uh, that, that, that we see is around the idea of, the reverse shoulder replacement, anatomical shoulder replacement, or sort of normal shoulder replacement. Now, there, there's a few different terms, and certainly that also can be a cause of some confusion for, for, for people who may be getting ready or thinking about uh, a shoulder replacement. Can you help shed some light on, on those two? What are the differences, and, and what would be the different from you know, the patient's point of view in terms of getting ready for surgery, rehab, and, and so on? Okay, so the the fundamental difference between a shoulder and every other joint replacement is that the movement of the shoulder is, is governed uh, by dynamic forces, i.e. muscles. And so most other joints um, are, are held together by the bones and they're, they're what we call constrained or they have ligaments or um, bone which holds everything in the right place. Whereas in the shoulder, we have a very big ball and a very small socket, and that's fantastic because it facilitates huge amounts of movement, but it does mean that things can dislocate and it does mean that we, we are, the muscle control is essential. And the muscle control is governed by a group of muscles that we call the rotator cuff. Now, if we take a step back from arthritis, um, the leading cause of problems for my patient population in the shoulder is problems with their rotator cuff. And so we, we therefore have um, the group of patients that develop arthritis are those uh, more experienced people at the later end of their, their age range. Um, and that group is also the people that have problems with rotator cuff issues. And so what we have found over the years is that actually the, the patients that develop primary arthritis, loss of cartilage in the shoulder, and the patients that develop rotator cuff problems may actually be two different groups based upon um, the, how their shoulder bones are put together. Okay. So if your glenoid points slightly upwards, you're mm -hmm. more likely to get rotator cuff problems. And if your glenoid points slightly downwards, you're more likely to get osteoarthritis. Anyhow. If you have a good rotator cuff um, and arthritis, mm -hmm. then we can make your shoulder look like a normal shoulder and we can expect it to work like a normal shoulder. Mm -hmm. And therefore we do what's called an anatomic replacement, which looks like a normal shoulder. We have a, a we replace the ball on the humerus with a ball and we replace the cup on the glenoid with a plastic cup. Um, now, in order for that to work though, we do have to have this intact rotator cuff and in order to get to the shoulder, we have to um, divide one of those tendons at the front of the shoulder and we have to repair it. And it's really important that that repair heals. Mm -hmm. And so in that group of people, this is where we use the external rotation sling to protect that repair um, and allow that repair to heal in a, in a neutral position. Mm -hmm. Now, if, however, we have a group of patients whereby the rotator cuff has been damaged, they develop a very special type of arthritis because when the rotator cuff is torn, it allows the ball to move a lot more within the socket. Mm 
Um, and that abnormal movement, particularly upwards, causes a special type of arthritis in itself, which we call a rotator cuff arthropathy. Now, if we put a normal shoulder replacement into a shoulder which has an abnormal movement, then that no shoulder replacement will just have an abnormal movement and will fail very, very quickly. And so in that situation, we, what we do is we reverse the shoulder and we put the ball on the cup side and the cup on the ball side. And by doing that, we, we develop a degree of constraint within the system which holds the whole joint together. It's much more like a, a hip replacement type principle. That the whole thing is held together by the construct of the, of the replacement. Now that does have a disadvantage, that it means that the, the movement of the shoulder may well be less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but from a patient point of view, because the movement prior to shoulder replacement surgery is not very good anyhow, then in both types of replacement, you get a lot more. And a reverse replacement can give you what I would refer to as a full functional range of motion. Okay. It enables you to do all the activities of daily living. It enables you to use your arm in all the positions that you would do commonly. Mm -hmm. um, and if we look at how people move their shoulders, we find that 97% of all activity is done between 30 degrees of external rotation and 120 degrees of forward elevation. Okay. okay? Now, what doesn't happen in those ranges is higher function, playing tennis, swimming, um, and the stuff that maybe our younger patients would want to do more of, um, and certainly as time goes by, some of our older patients want to do more of. And so an anatomic replacement um, gives you the potential to do more of those activities in higher ranges and, and greater um, movement, particularly rotation. Okay. However, the leading cause of failure of anatomic replacements um, is rotator cuff failure. Right. So you, you suddenly get this shoulder now, which works a lot better, it moves more, um, and now your rotator cuff is asked to do more than it did before. Right. And the natural history of rotator cuff disease comes in. And so, what we do we have to do is look at the very specifics of each patient, the quality of their bone, mm -hmm. the quality of their tendons, and look at what the requirements for their function are and make them on a very individual basis. Because some people may say, look, I don't need to play tennis. I, I'm totally comfortable with having a shoulder which works in a functional way. Mm -hmm. um, I am getting older and my rotator cuff is, is not in great condition. And therefore, it may be beneficial to us to go straight to a reverse replacement, which may be more predictable. Now, science hasn't given us that, that, that answer yet. And so um, it is highly likely over the course of the next few years that we will do a proper randomized trial of this mm -hmm. to see whether or not that theoretical um, rationale actually plays out in reality. Okay. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And, and, and in terms of, so the, the, the main difference then from a patient's point of view between these two options is, is, is perhaps some, some difference in, in, range, in range of movement, but that may not necessarily be noticeable on the day to day. Hmm. Does, does that mean that there is any, is there any difference in terms of the rehab and post-operative exercises or indeed the things that one should try to do before surgery? So, um, yes and no. Very few of my patients actually know what they've had done. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, well, they know what they've had done, but they, they, they don't appreciate any difference. Right. So most patients find that whichever type of shoulder placement they have, um, they get a much better range of motion than they had before. And most importantly, the shoulder doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. And so, um, and again, on the day of surgery, as a patient, you would know very, very little difference between these two entities. Um, and it's it, from a patient point of view on the day not much has changed mm -hmm. now what we the biggest difference comes between the amount of rotator cuff which has been left at the time of surgery mm -hmm. and so if we have a reverse replacement whereby we do have rotator cuff deficiency mm -hmm. but we have a reasonable amount of cuff left that can be utilized then the rehabilitation will be very similar. And so we will have to try and maximize the function of those muscles. 
Um, and what most of the research has shown is actually the more rotator cuff you have in a reverse replacement, the better function that you get. Okay. Yeah. And because you get more power. Yeah. However, some cases, um, and certainly the original cohort of patients that had reverse replacements had very little rotator cuff left. And so in those people, it was much more focused on maximizing the function of the other muscles around the shoulder, mm -hmm. um, such as the deltoid muscle, in order to be able to take over and compensate. And so what we're finding is as the indications for these two different types of replacements becomes more blurred, mm -hmm. the rehabilitation becomes more similar. Um, and a lot of the, uh, and again, a lot of this depends upon the communication between surgeon and rehab team as to what actually the pathology is inside. Why have you done this particular replacement and what, what is the left to rehabilitate? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, what we find is that there is this funny muscle at the front of the shoulder called subscapularis. Mm -hmm. um, and of all the rotator cuff muscles, that is the one that's least um, affected by rotator cuff disease. Mm -hmm. And so there is a um, division of opinion in shoulder surgeons at the moment as to what to do with that in a reverse replacement. Um, and if you have no muscles at the back of the shoulder, but you have a good subscapularis and you go and repair it, then it massively overpowers the front of the shoulder compared to the back. Mm -hmm. um, equally, if you've got good muscles at the back, Mm -hmm. then you, you should repair the subscap to give yourself a forced couple and balance. And so, again, we're back again to looking at each individual case, each individual set of pathologies, each individual amount of bone, each individual amount of tendons, and working how to construct a shoulder placement that will be give the best amount of function in that individual patient. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. And so... But, but if, if, if you think back then over, over the years of, 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 uh, of the many years of doing shoulder replacement and, you know, w w would you say, you know, in general terms, is there anything that, that, that you see in, 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 those, in your patients who've done, who've done really well, who are just doing, you know, who, who, are, who are doing what they want to be doing with their new shoulder? Is there a, a common denominator in terms of, you know, what they've done in terms of rehab or, or, or anything else? Um. Not really. I, I think the one of the key things is not to let them get stiff in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. And so again, having this um, principle of, of coming out of the sling as fast as you can in a safe way. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we can get our rehab going early mm -hmm. um, and allow us to prevent stiffness from starting, then we can make the journey through rehab quicker. Yeah. Now, it's likely that even if stiffness develops in the early stages, it sorts itself out mm -hmm. over time. But, you know, it can just make things a little easier. Yeah. Um, and so looking at how you put your shoulder placement in, which type of implant you do use, how you repair the t any tendons to facilitate doing that early mobilization, I think is quite important. I think if you are going to immobilize someone, you need to think about why. Mm -hmm. um, and it should be an exception as opposed to a rule. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do notice that those patients that have shoulder replacements for trauma mm -hmm. are, are a little slower um, and, and do struggle a bit more with movement and stiffness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably because the environment of the shoulder is much more in terms of healing and stiffening. Um, and there's much more likely that you have to repair um, bits of bone and bits of tendon around the replacement. Um, what we also know is the more movement that you had beforehand, the more likely you are to get good movement afterwards. And that's slightly paradoxical um, because I am still of the belief that a shoulder replacement should be the last thing that you get to as opposed to trying to do it early in your arthritis journey because um, there, there are appreciable complications. Um, but there is no doubt that the, the more movement you have at the beginning, the more movement you're likely to retain and get back to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the last thing is just making sure you do it properly. And, um, you know, for the first eight to nine years of my joint replacement career, that was all done by, by eyeball. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're moving very much towards uh, three-dimensional computer planning, 
we're moving towards custom made implants, custom made jigs. And the more accurate you can be, uh, the more likely it is that you will restore um, an anatomical construct, which will give better function. Yeah. And, and I guess that, that that's the other side of this evolution of innovation and change and, and, and gradual improvements that we're seeing in orthopedics. Mm. Um, and, and again, forcing yourself to do things slightly outside of your comfort zone, um, which, which COVID has kind of done for us over the last six to nine months, yeah. um, has, has made us look in a slightly different way at many of those technologies. Um, if you're doing these types of operations outside of the hospitals that you're traditionally happy with, you know, we're really lucky at Wrightington. Um, I have every conceivable shoulder toy known to man um, at my immediate disposal. Whereas in different hospitals, you, you may not be as fortunate to have all the different sets and multiple different sets in order to be able to um, have all the options available to you interoperatively. Right. And so what templating does and what um, computer, the use of computer technologies do is allow you to be a bit more specific about what you're likely to expect um, and, and just plan. Um, and again, back to moving towards day case shoulder places, it, it's all about the planning. And um, you know, my journey has gone from me being retrospective to an entire system being prospective. Mm. And, and by doing that, um, we're able to do things in a much more refined way. And being familiar with it, there's no getting away from that. The more of this you do, the more comfortable you become. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, we've, we, we've, I think we've covered some, some really, really good ground. One, one question that, that, that I know we, we, should, we, should, uh, we should tackle before, before we, we sign this off, because it's, it's, it's also a, a frequently, frequently asked one, is how long a new, this new joint will last? So for someone having uh, a new shoulder in 2020, how long should one expect it to last? So the, the data is out there for anatomical shoulder placements. Mm -hmm. Um, and one would hope that you should get a good 15 to 20 years out of an anatomical shoulder placement. Um, reverse replacements are, are more difficult because we haven't been doing it for that long. Um, and, you know, but the data is encouraging and again is showing longevity um, between 15 and 20 years. We probably will find that the complication, what causes the revisions to be different. Mm -hmm. um, and in an anatomic replacement, the weak part has always been the, the cup, the glenoid. Um, it's a very small piece of plastic and a very, very small piece of bone. And um, plastic wears away over time. And, and that is always going to be the weak link. Mm -hmm. um, in a reverse replacement, because we're using a ball, we actually bolt all the glenoid in with metal, you know, big screws. And so the glenoid is more secure and, and we're not seeing glenoid failure in the ways that we potentially anticipated we would do mm -hmm. um, because we've we've realized actually the the biggest problem is is the humerus um impinging on the scapula because it moves in a different way instead of moving within the socket it moves around the socket mm -hmm. um, and and we've learned how to minimize that over the years and by doing so, the, the, the glenoids are, are, are pretty stable and, and don't seem to be failing in the way that either an anatomic did or all that we would predict. And so what we are finding is the humerus, which could then cause a the problem. So as time goes by, you, you, you learn the deficiencies of the techniques. And so that's where the next kind of evolution in shoulder placements is understanding how these fail and, and, and how we go about changing them in the future. Unfortunately, at Wrightington, a fair number of failed ones come our way to fix from around the region as we're a tertiary centre. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that process of looking at why things have not done so well really helps you understand how you should change those things in your own practice in the primaries. Okay, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Well, I think we've, I mean, this has been, a, 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 I've certainly enjoyed this, uh, this, this conversation and, and I hope those who've, uh, who, who sent in and, and requested a shoulder replacement special have too. So, and, and as ever, you know, thank you so much everyone for, for watching and for, for suggesting these topics. If there, and there's clearly, there is so much more to cover on this topic and, uh, and we may well, you know, need, 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 need to get back to that. But sort of to, to, to sign off, Mike, what would be your... Uh, message to anyone watching this now who is getting ready for a shoulder replacement? Um, don't be too worried. 
you know, shoulder replacement surgery has come on a long way in the last 10 to 15 years. It's now a very reproducible, predictable operation and, and, and in most cases a reliable one. Um, make sure that you've had a, a long discussion with your surgeon about what you're going to have done. Make sure you feel very confident in your understanding um, and, and make sure that the person that's doing this for you does, does enough to have these systems in place to make sure it's reliable for you. And make sure, you know, I, I say to all my patients that ultimately you've got to make sure that you're having the right operation done for you at the right time. Um, and be very confident in your mind that you've done everything not to be there um, and that you're having your shoulder placement when all of those factors in, in terms of your function, your pain, um, you've exhausted those non-drug replacement options and then this is the right thing for you at the right point in time. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mike. And as ever, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Um, keep up the good work. Send in any questions and suggestions for the topics, and uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye bye.